Welcome and thanks for joining us. My guest today is Dan Kent. He is the Chief Technology Officer at Red River Technology. Dan, good to have you with us. It's good to be here, Tom. And our topic is artificial intelligence. That's everybody's topic these days, but I don't think there's too much information that federal practitioners can get about it. And so right. let me ask you from your standpoint, and you're a 25-year technology practitioner yourself, sure. what do you feel are the top use cases? Because really, without a use case, it's right. pretty hard to proceed, isn't it? Sure, sure, and there's hundreds of use cases out there for AI in, in, in that discipline. Uh, what we're seeing a lot is, in, really there are different types of AI. The one that most common you're hearing about today is generative AI. And by far the most common use case there is really around using chat bots, how they can help customer service by uh, leveraging automation and tools to answer the customer with proper answer to any of the questions that they may have. So pretty much every agency is looking at some form of chat bot to deploy. Uh, if you look at be, look beyond that, a great use case for AI is really around surveillance and uh, identification of systems. And they use this in public safety. They use this mm -hmm. uh, in cybersecurity, right? There's many use uh, examples of those types of use cases across, across, across multiple disciplines. And then I think the, the last one is really about automating systems and, and being able to do common t tools or common processes that people would use. Uh, AI, let's... Uh, the system do that automatically. And again, that's really useful in the IT space that we'll talk a little bit about AI ops. Uh, fighting cybersecurity issues is a, a great use case there. Yeah, sure. And getting back to the chatbots, sure. then you would need, as an agency, the access to the information to answer a chat. That's right, that's right. And so that seems like a good, almost a safe way of using generative because the language model on which it, it would be drawing, you can carefully control. Is that That's right. It, it is. It's part of the service desk response answers, and so there's probably a lot of history there, and they would know 95 to 98 percent of the questions that are already going to be coming in, so they can have the machine automatically answer those for the uh, citizens that are coming in and calling with the problem or the question. And probably answer it more maybe conversationally than chatbots now can. That's right. And even, you know, take it to the next level of questioning if, they, if it's built into the tool. Understood. And I guess probably it can maybe gather information on trends about what people are asking about and so get better at it and maybe help the, the yeah, outfit. Yeah, absolutely. As part of AI, is, 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 it's really AI is based on data and reviewing data, data analytics. So anytime you're using an AI tool, you buy, you're inherently getting analytics built into that. So the more you learn from the questions and your answers that you get, the more predictive you can be. And that's really where we want to go with AI is be more predict predictive, uh, then feed another system that would end if there's actually something wrong with a, inherently wrong in a system, whether it's a wireless device or a security attack, uh, that predictive capability can actually prevent that in the future. Got it, and talking about surveillance and ID uh, systems, do you mean in the, in the uh, image recognition and imagery systems? Well, or? It's, it's interesting about this. It can be that, and it certainly is. If you look at uh, you know, public safety, DHS, they're certainly looking at surveillance from a uh, vehicle, from a uh, people pers uh, perspective, it could even be um, things, right? Uh, but it also can be uh, cyber. It can be, you know, IT-based. So we use AI to um, inspect and surveil uh, the system and uh, data flowing over the network all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so it can go, it, like I said, there are many use cases in that surveillance space. The idea is data is going by and That's you're correct. analyzing it as it's flowing, so to speak. In real time, and then you can compare that to historicals and you can uh, make some assumptions and predictions. All right, and um, what about the information technology landscape itself? I've heard a lot of people, like one suggestion I heard is if we could apply AI to legacy code and understand what the heck is going on That's in right. there, you could speed up modernization, that type of thing. A absolutely, and we're seeing that everywhere. Every vendor, whether it's a software vendor or a hardware vendor, is integrating AI capabilities into their tools. And we see that uh, from an IT perspective, we call it AI ops. How do they make operations of IT more simple, leveraging AI? Uh, and it ranges everywhere from helping end user uh, experience, uh, things such as WebEx or Zoom. They use AI to ensure that the audio is correct on the on both sides of the, the, the room systems. Uh, or it can be detecting. I haven't been able to tell yet. <laughs> you, you should be. You should be. And they, they'll actually do things like record, and um, they will 
they will tra transcribe the meetings, they will summarize the meetings, they'll tell you who was the lead speaker in the meeting. All that is based on AI, which typically would have taken a person to do all that in the past. So that's one example in a collaboration suite. So it could tell the boss or the manager, hey, you're talking too much. That's right. It also can say, here was a summary of the meeting so you don't have to take notes, uh, which is nice. Um, but it goes everywhere from there from to the cybersecurity play and how it can help um, work with threat intelligence and, and again be more predictive and actually resolve problems before they actually become impactful to the uh, end users. Now AI ops, the term sounds similar to DevOps and DevSecOps oh, sure. in which you regularize and almost you know make a machine out of the release of software capability on regular intervals mm -hmm. and small mm -hmm. batches or small increments. Can that term AI ops also mean that? That is the deployment of algorithms and training them in regular intervals so you keep getting more and more artificially intelligent over time. That, that it's exactly what it does, right? So it's, it's really about taking all the data, whether it's coming in from NetFlow or coming in from um, logs, and so you have all the historical data, uh, then you see what's happening real time across the network, and these tools, whether it's a, uh, a cyber tool or a configuration tool or a, um, a customer satisfaction tool, they leverage all of that to ensure that if anything, any anomaly happens, which they're going to first detect the anomaly, they can then um, remediate that anomaly real time, right? So before it actually has any impact. That's, that's the goal of AI ops. Uh, there, it, obviously, as the, each company has their own strategy there, and they'll be flowing products and features out. Um, they're already starting to, but they'll continue to do that. And eventually, you'll start to see these systems and networks be self-healing. Self that's really the goal here. And that's something that's been talked about for probably 30 years in networking, Absolutely. the idea. Absolutely, and, and it's, it's the, the marriage of the big data plus the analytics, and then the instrumentation to allow you to do something with the analytics to uh, automate the process so there's really no human that's needed to be done. now. Like I said, we're still a ways from making that uh, real uh, across everything, but with many instances of it do happening within certain aspects of the IT structure. And so if you have this continuous improvement AI ops type of cycle, and you have automation in the way it applies itself to the system you're operating, at what point does the human operators have to intervene to make sure it's not drifting off course? Because something could be just a tiny bit off in the beginning. That's right. But three weeks down the road or a year later, it's way off course. Well, hopefully the, the system would be able to re re reset itself as well, right? You, you set up the policies ahead of time, you compare against policy all along. <clears throat> I think the issue really about having uh, humans interact, and by the way, that's how we do it today. Typically, most of these systems, uh, they could remediate, but typically there's a human interaction in the middle there to make sure it's the right thing to do until we feel comfortable, uh, until we know that enough variables are taken into consideration. Uh, but eventually we'll be able to do it all without the human interaction happening. And for agencies to get into this whole AI and AI ops, my sense is that you need to have your users, your clients, your customers, either internally or externally involved in this because they know what they need to get out of it. No, actually with AI ops, you probably can do it all without the end users even knowing it's happening. That's how we would <laughs> have it taken care of for the most part. It, it's, it is about like I said, if you have any type of anomalous behavior or issues uh, with performance, it gets addressed without the user even knowing it's happened. Uh, that's the goal of AI ops. Right now, of course, the way most IT departments find out is a phone call to the service desk. Service desk says, John in this area of the building can't get access to an application. Uh, so that's how it gets initiated. Uh, with AI ops, that's happening real time. Typically, the system would even know before John knew what the actual, uh, what causing the event and how to remediate that event. But what about, say, areas of operations outside of IT mm -hmm. and you feel like there, there's efficiencies that can be gained here, processing of paper applications for something or sure. adjudication procedures, these things happen across the government. Uh, can't can't your, your, oper your employees, your users, be able to say, if I could speed this up. Oh, of course. Yeah, I, I think the, the one, if the more the consumer, the end users know about the technology, the better, right? Um, but there's a the concept called predictive analytics or predictive AI, which really gets down to how do I take my data in more in the mission side outside of IT and do something with that to make, make my job easier, automate what I'm doing. So I don't consider that AI ops 
AI ops is typically the IT department using AI. Okay. Uh, I think a predictive AI is saying, how do I, you know, look at all these case folders and get them all summarized for me so I don't have to do it myself. Uh, I, I would call that more of the traditional AI or predictive AI that we, it's very common in the government. Uh, and, and we're seeing that deployed. Most of the use cases in the government are using AI in that form, um, whether it's in translating systems or looking at case management and, you know, redacting automatically or uh, summarizing. So there's lots of use cases there as well. And by the way, does widespread adoption of AI algorithms and the processing they do, does that stress the uh, IT infrastructure you might have in place or most places have the processing power they sure. need? Sure, I, I think if you look at, <clears throat> again, I, I look at really two different types of AI. One, the predictive or classical AI, which most agencies have, they're beyond research and development there. They're deploying in many cases. Uh, if you look at uh, generative AI and the, the real, what's, what we're seeing in the last 12 months. In that case, yes, we're definitely seeing it's a different architecture. Uh, you have different tools that you need to build that in uh, using more GPU based systems uh, versus a classic CPU system. So that requires a whole new way of thinking and a whole new way of delivering services in the back end so that you can get the front end, you know, the LLMs or the natural learning um, protocols across as well. Yeah, because that's, that's big data in some that's cases. That's exactly what it is, that's right. But it strikes me that agencies that were skeptical or even afraid of generative AI based on what's being seen out in the public mm -hmm. can avoid that if you just simply control your language model. That is what you feed it. That's right, that's right. And I think there's going to be a, a big push in the government to leverage just private, we'll call it private AI. Uh, you know, having your own AI stack that would be in your premises or in your environment uh, and then taking and using your own LLM or large language model. Um, again, many of the classic AI use cases don't use large language models. They work. They do wonderful things for the government every day. Um, but using generative AI with uh, either their own large leverage uh, learning model or taking some open source and bringing them in house and, and expanding and uh, using those as the base model for you to build your own is what we're going to see in the federal government. All right. So you know, there's a policy out now. There's guidance. There's right. Massive documentation coming out of the administration now for use of AI. That's it was brand new as we were speaking. Yes. I guess the question is, uh, what comes next? What do you see coming in the year ahead? Now that, especially now that this White House guidance is out. Sure. I think it, it really is about everybody has to understand. I look back when Cloud First came out in 2011 and 2012, and we're kind of at that stage now with AI, uh, defining what AI is understanding the uh, considerations for delivering and using AI. So I think the next three to six months is about understanding all the, the benefits of AI, but also the considerations of, about AI, and then realize what's out there. There's a, it's happening so fast in terms of the development and the uh, solutions that are being created. Uh, a lot of it is open source. A lot of it is out in the uh, public cloud. So how to make the federal agencies use that better? Or how do I bring that in-house? Uh, is what we're going to be working on with, with our government customers. Uh, and then understanding the ethical aspects of all of it. Uh, I think, again, if I look at the big AI spectrum, and AI is a discipline, uh, if, if I look at 70% of AI, it's not generative AI. It just keeps going as usual and keep going deeper than that. The generative AI is really what we're talking about with all of this getting up to speed on, on what it actually means, what, what it's going to mean to you. And just like cloud, I think most of our agencies are seeing that uh, the mission side or the business side are probably further ahead than IT here. Sure. Uh, because they're the ones that are talking with the vendors that use it every day and have the real use cases. And those that actually do software coding, whether in the government, then there are people in the government that do it, or sure. the contractors, should they be worried about AI generating code? No, I, <laughs> I don't think so. I, I think at the end of the day, we'll figure out how to use it proper, properly. Um, there's definitely a, ethical aspects of it and giving uh, proper credit to where credit's due and being able to at, get proper attribution of the code. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, it's going to be much more of a useful tool once we all figure out how to work properly with it. And would it be fair okay. to say that as the chief technology officer at Red River, this occupies a lot of your thinking because yeah. a lot of people are asking you about it all the time? Absolutely, 100%. Uh, uh, it's probably about 65% of my time is spent on AI right now and, and what we think we can add value to our government customers with. Uh, and again, I, I, I look at it as AI ops one area. I look at it as a pre a predictive or uh, classic AI, and then I look at generative AI. So three really big areas there that we help our customers with. So you need your own AI ops. 
Oh, absolutely. I think every company is going to be using AI ops for, for sure. All right. Thanks yeah. so much for being with us. Thank you. It's been great. Dan I Kent is the Chief Technology Officer at Red River Technology. I'm Federal Drive host Tom Temin. You're watching Federal News Network. For more on this discussion, please visit federalnewsnetwork.com and search Red River Technology.